Shall we wait for more? Okay, I'll I'll wait until the queue for the coffee machine has dissolved. Prepare myself mentally. Hi. Morning. Hi. We zijn nou twee tegelijk, hè, die het doen. Dat is natuurlijk wel fijn. Ja, ja. Ja, ik ben. Oh, what's in the bathroom? Yeah. Talk to <laughs> well, it's easy. It's easy. It's easy to forget, right? <laughs> and those are usually the most popular sections. If you have them, you'll get thousands of <laughs> thousands of hits on your video. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was afraid of that. You could hear me, yes. so uh, we tried to not make jokes, but that was <laughs> a challenge as usual. Right? Um. Okay. Um. <clears throat> So, um, right, okay, so, um, so my name is Edser Papersma, for those who didn't yet figure that out, so you all wrote up, signed up for the program, so uh, that's not unexpected, I guess. Um, I promised to say a little bit, to say something about uh, statistics for spatiotemporal data and introduction, and uh, so we have always to tell Tom our sort of, the topic what we're going to talk about, like two months or three months before we do it. And it's always a challenge. Um, um, Spatiotemporal is the is, is is obvious sort of in in my very much in the center of my uh, domain of interest. I will not say so very much about statistics. Maybe on the end of the day, I hope that we'll take a look at the uh, data from the contest and and try to do something smart with them. Uh, but it's not it's not a talk about statistics, but more about spatiotemporal data and. Uh, and also spatial temporal data in R. Uh, so it, it's, it's more sort of the, the build steps towards that. You might wonder where the slides are. Uh, did anyone find, of you find the slides? The PDF. the PDF, you found it? Good, so you found it, where did you find it? In the, uh, the HTTP, you, it's in, the, in, in your course site. Right. It's, uh, so it's in my core site, there's HTTP where you find my slides. So I, uh, they should, the last one, they should be sort of updated three minutes ago. Um, okay, so, um, good, I'm a bit nervous. Um, so, right, so uh, then this, um, this, um, uh, so the, the the first sort of first hour that I maybe hour that I talk will be a bit like will be mostly like a lecture, right? Not not sort of hands-on things, but more thoughts about how the you know how data, what data are, and basically about <laughs> the fields, objects, dichotomy, and how we can represent it, how other people have done that, and um, 
that comes a little bit sort of uh, inspired by the early work of, uh, of Stevenson's on the theory of measurement scales. Yes, this is always the, the, the paper that I start my introductory statistics classes with. It is the paper that says, well, here we are, I'm reporting from the committee that started in 1932, and now it's 1938, and now its final report went out in 1940, so we, we thought about eight years about this topic, and we com came up with ideas about uh, a theory of measurement scale. So they came up with the four measurement scales, um, ordinal, nom nominal ordinal <laughs> interval ratio, right? So assume, I assume you will, you will know this, right? So we have categorical, non-categorical, num numerical, non-numerical, numerical data for which zero has a meaning, and so on. So it is, uh, this sort of leads to ideas what you can do with data, how you plot data, what are categories, what are factors, what are numeric data, and so on. Um, the, there has been continuation on this by, uh, in, a, in a paper by, by Hand in 1996, Statistics and the Theory of Measurement. So it is basically looks at the consequences that measurement theory has for statistics, which statistical models can you do on which kind of ta data. It was uh, essentially qu the question if psychology or social scientists measure things on Likert scales, where you say one to five, sort of click, sort of one, yes, I like it, no, I don't like it, uh, or, or, or rate it or something. And it's, of course, not an absolute numerical scale, right? Like temperature or like mass or, or velocity and so on. Uh, can we still do the same statistical methods on these data? A lot of people did do that, and there was a lot of this debate whether this is meaningful or not. Um, Stevens measurement scale are not the only ones, so there's an excellent paper by Nick, Nick Chrisman, uh, Beyond Stevens, a revised approach to measurement for geographic information, which, which talks about measurement scales that they are essentially uh, more complicated if we look at, for instance, spatial phenomena or temporal phenomena. So you could, you could argue the measurement scales from Stevens, ordinal nominal interval ratio, are one-dimensional. Yes, if I only look at one variable, what type does it have? What are the consequences of that? But if I have a time series, uh, it's a different thing. Like it is something that varies over time, so it's a two-dimensional thing already. So, uh, and he said, well, if I have time, then there are all kinds of other issues. Like I have a cyclic scale, right? I have diurnal cycles, weekly cycles, monthly cycles, yearly cycles, and so on. And it, you can't look at them at the same th at the same way as you would do. For, uh, for just numerical, just for interval or racial scales, right? Uh, so this is a very, sort of very uh, inspiring paper. Uh, then there is a paper that, uh, or a guest editorial that appeared in 2003 um, from my former colleague, Werner Kuhn, who's now in the, in the, started in January in the um, University of Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, and it is about semantic reference systems. So that, that takes the idea of reference systems as we know it from coordinate reference systems and puts that on, let's say, on meaning of words, right? Meaning of, of terms and so on. So how do we, how do we use uh, terms and, and, and what are the sort of, what are the computer science tools that we can use uh, to sort of uh, create order in the chaos, right? Um, Building on that, uh, using the, you know, the experience of Werner Kuhn, who used to be in my institute, uh, and, and, his, and his group, which has a long legacy, uh, together with a PhD student of mine, Christoph Stasch, we then wrote this paper uh, that took us like one and a half year to, to write, really, to really think and write. And um, it's, the, it's sort of from the papers I've written so far, it's the one that, the, my favorite at this moment, I would say. Yes, it is... Uh, um, because a lot of thought and a lot of pleasure went into it, into uh, writing it. Um, and we look at the processes of spatial prediction and aggregation, which are two basic two things you do often in spatial statistics, and I looked at whether, sort of whether, when are these processes meaningful to apply, and when are they not meaningful, and can we sort of, you know, find out when, when this takes place. And um, I, to be honest, uh, I'm still uh, trying to understand this paper, right? So there's a lot of... <laughs> So it's, it's, first of all, it's very long, yeah, so um, the, 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 the good thing about a paper is that it's open access. Uh, we had to pay for that, but um, anyway, it's, so it's good for you. Um, it's very long, and, and maybe one of the causes was that, uh, that, that, that the two first authors are German, and Germans tend to do things very, very solid, elaborate, but also complicated, right? Um, uh, the other thing is that we try to use uh, higher-order logic and, and, and functional expressions in higher order logic to actually prove that something at some stage is meaningful. And I'm still trying to understand what we did there. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite, ex I find it quite exciting. I'm, 
I'm a complete novice on the area of logic. Uh, I'll try to sort of um, here communicate the ideas from this paper that I understood. Yes. So hopefully I'll not trap into things that I don't understand. Um, the, 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 the basic idea here is the mo motivation for this whole paper is that uh, we have here uh, two variables. On the top row you see CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions from power plants in the country Germany. This is the outline of Germany where the, the color indicates, well, there's no scale, but the color indicates sort of the amount of yearly CO2 emissions from each of the power plants. And at the bottom row, we see PM10 measurements. PM10 is an air quality indicator, so it's, it's, it's a fine dust in, in air. So there are also points where these are measured. These are not all the points, but sort of the rural points. Um, and um, so not the ones in the cities, uh, rural points. And, they, and the color indicates, again, sort of air quality at some, at some moment in time. And then we did the same thing to them. Here we computed the sum of all the measurements. So this is yearly, yearly emissions in tons. And so you get a sum that's very large, large number yearly for total. And here we interpolate it. It doesn't look looks very uh, bad because of the scale and so on. You get a few peaks there and there, but this is an interpolated surface. Here we did the same, the same thing. We added the sum of the thing and we uh, interpolated the map which looks much nicer, but this may be much less nice because it's about air quality. And the thing is that uh, basically the data um, are the same, right? It, at, le at least the, the things I do to my data in R and so on, they are coordinates with values, right? They are coordinates with values, points, points. And I can compute the sum and I can interpolate, right? So there's no problem there. The problem comes when you try to think, try to understand, try to explain, so what's going on here? So when I try to, uh, so can somebody sort of uh, indicate a problem here, sort of one of the sort of right-hand side four images where there might be a problem of understanding what the number means or what it represents or so? Um, well, let's say inverse distance interpolation or some creaking variety. Um, well, you mean in these data, these data are complete. These are all the power plants that are there in the country, the ones that are registered, uh, yes, used uh, for the public electricity net. The, you know, people might have private, or factories might have, have a, a sort of smaller installations that are not in this database. But this is about the, the electricity net used power plants. Yes? Scale is missing, yes, true. Okay, I'll give the scale, right? So here, um, I don't know the numbers, but this is tons per year. This is for 2007, right? This is on a day. This is a daily mean PM10 value. So this is, so this is tons. Yeah, Robert? Right. So this one is not very good as an as an as an indicator for for whatever it should be. Yes. So if you think about what it should be, right? So I go, I interpolate. So what I do here is I take two power a couple of power plants, look at the neighborhood, go to a location, right, and interpolate <laughs> emissions there at that location. But at at a location where there's no power plant. So it's a bit of a, um, in terms of interpolating, it's a bit of a strange thing to do. So you can, of course, try to use these data to do something with air quality or do something with, you know, CO2 emissions, but interpolating is not really the uh, appropriate method in the sense that this is not uh, what, what we call, uh, I mean, there is, not, there is nothing to, there is no, power plant emissions to be observed between two power plants. Yes, that is, the, that is the thing here. So there is nothing you can observe when you interpolate something here that you could compare it to. So although there might be a structure in the 
you know, there might be a signal in the, in the data when they interpolate, it is not interpretable in the sense of a predicted value, in the sense of a predicted value that you could possibly compare to an observed value. Uh, there's in contrast to here, where there is PM10 everywhere, this is an air quality parameter that I could measure everywhere, and I interpolate it because I didn't measure it, I only have measurements here. So this makes perfectly sense. This one does not, does not make, in that sense, does not make sense. And for the, uh, for the sums, it is a, bit, a little bit the reverse. So you could say, well, the total emissions of Germany, I compute like this. I just sum all the yearly emissions for each of the power plants and get the total power plant emissions. For PM10, this is not like a sum that has a meaning for Germany, right? It's a sum that has a meaning, well, maybe in the context of these stations, but if I draw it in a map like this and don't tell which stations or how many stations it was computed over, it's not, it's meaningless, right? So if this, if a country would say, well, my summed PM10 concentration is like uh, 10 times as high, then it might be a problem, but if it has like 100 times as many measurements, it's, it's like, you know, much less of a problem. But it drops that information, essentially. Yeah, so we would say, here, this is not meaningful, this is not meaningful. And then we went, we went to go to great lengths to, uh, you know, to kind of uh, argue or, or try to find a way how to argue about that. Um, so we have, in, the, in both cases, we have spatiotemporal data. Uh, we, they look like spatial data, but as I mentioned, these data are yearly totals for 2007, and these data are the, um, for some date, I believe, in 1st of June 2010 or something like that, every daily average value. So they are kind of what we would say, um, well, you could say it's, it's a snapshot in time, but they are actually aggregates over time, right? So... Um, I argue here that all data are spatiotemporal. So we opened the book, the Yastar book on um, applied spatial data analysis with our book on spatial data are everywhere, uh, which is a nice phrase, but you could sort of make it uh, more extreme in the sense of saying that all data are spatial. I mean, space and time is where we live, and so it's difficult to imagine data that are not spatial or spatiotemporal. The thing is that many data, of course, for, for a lot of data, space and time are not so important, right? If a doctor is interested in my health, He's interested in like things like my blood pressure and cholesterol and not so much in where I am at this moment or something like that. Might be not completely irrelevant, but it's not of a main relevance. Um, there are no pure spatial data. So we look, of course, in these courses and GIS and so a lot of data where we think this is pure spatial, but it's never, right? So always maps reflect either a snapshot, so moment, so think a remote sensing image, or an aggregate of a time period like the ones that I showed here. Um, for instance, interpolated yearly average temperatures or yearly aggregated daily in interpolation. So you could do the aggregation over the interpolations. Yes. Either way, there is no sort of rule to do this. Um, or it might be something that is constant over a period of time. So think political boundaries. You think they never change, but they do, right? If you look at a larger time scale. Uh, or you could look at seemingly, seemingly non-changing phenomena like geology, but even geology changes, right? Think of, you know, talk to a geologist and, and, and ask, you know, how the world here looked like uh, 50 million years ago, and he will, she will come up with incredible stories. Um, in the same sense, there are no pure temporal data, right? We see a lot of time series data every day, but somehow they are connected to, to something, you know, if, if, not, if it's not clear, then, it's, then it might be the, the world, right? Uh, so quite often we see spatially aggregated values, we think of the, the hockey sticks, the temperature, global temperature curves, uh, which are also not of the subsurface and also not of the top of the atmosphere, but of sort of ground level uh, temperatures, uh, or they can be for a single spatial location. Uh, or they can be like 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 vaguely located. That is often if we have sort of data that that we as humans generate. So if we talk about values and so on, it's not so clear. You know, it's a it's a mutual understanding. It's a shared conceptualization, where they where there's not so much physics going on, right? From where did they measure something? But it's like a group of people agree that this is a this is the value. This is the price. These are stock quotes and so on. Um, we will now use uh, functions, and to, this is a basically a basic, very basic mathematical uh, conception that I will repeat a little bit, that I had to repeat for myself to understand what is what. But we will function to sort of explain a little of, a bit of concept. So I'll, I'll now re sort of uh, 
try to recall what functions are. So functions basically are mappings from one thing into another, right? So, so the function y is fx, we can write it as f colon x goes to y, sort of x maps into y, which means that for any x, we have a corresponding y. Yeah, so the, the important thing from functions is there's a direction, right? The arrow has a direction, the arrow doesn't go the other direction. So there's a relationship between x and y, but the relationship is directioned, yes? Um, I can also look at sort of the combination of x and y and write x times y being the Cartesian product. Yeah, so I can see x times y as the collection of all ordered pair x, y. So if we think of, if we, the easiest thing is, is of, a, of a, an area, right? So this is our study area where we have uh, x coordinates and y coordinates and all the possible points, basically that collection forms the Cartesian product. Of course, then I have bounded x and y to a certain region, right? So in principle, x times y is not sort of, I haven't bounded it, bounded it here. But this is the all possible combinations, right? And what a function now does, I quote from Wikipedia, yes, excellent mathematicians look at that. Uh, Wikipedia says a function f from x to y is a subset of the Cartesian product x and y, subject to the following condition, every element of x is the first component of one and only one ordered pair in the subset. Yeah, so this is a condition to x. In other words, for every x, for every value x in the variable x, there is exactly one element y such that the ordered pair xy is contained in the subset <coughs> defining the function f. Complex, yes, but it means basically what, what I said here above, that for any x we have one and only one corresponding y and not the reverse, yeah? So if I would then, so forget about space, if I then have two variables x and y, um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, something like this, is a, ooh, ooh, I just went a little bit wrong here, is a function, right? Because for every x, yes, I have one single value y, yes? Not the reverse, if I take y, for instance, well, for instance, here it works, no, it doesn't work, so I have this value, and I have this value, right? So for, for a given y, I have, for instance, two, I might have one value x, I might have zero values x, and so on, right? So it's, it's one, it, is, it has a direction here. So these are functions. Uh, functions are, are important. We call x, in the function we call x the domain, and we call y the codomain or the range. Um, we can, so as I mentioned, we can take inverse of functions, yes? But inverse of functions are not functions. Right, not necessary. So we can invert some functions. We can, of course, say, well, if we have uh, the, the function uh, square root x, yes, so here we have x, here we have uh, sort of well, sorry, square root x, we can invert it, right? And we can invert it and we can say, well, and then we sort of, we get this one, right? So we get x, we get here square root x, and here x, or here x, and x squared, right? So some functions we can invert and get a function, but in general, we cannot, like here, we cannot, right? So in general, functions cannot be, uh, when inverted, don't give, a func don't give a function. But we can, of course, ask for a particular y, so give me the set of x values for which uh, f of x is y, right? And that gives you then a set. So in inverting functions is, is useful. Uh, now we will look at reference systems, sort of, and, and use the concept reference systems for everything, uh, everything in the rest of the world. Um, so reference system, basically, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't look uh, look up definitions, but let's let's loosely describe them as conventions that encode a shared understanding of information. Right. So reference systems, think of spatial reference system. We talked a lot about that. So we have two numbers. We have fifty, you know, fifty-two and eight. Uh, so that could be, a, you know, a point, it could be two coordinates, but we can only give meaning to that point in the sense of a shared understanding which point on the Earth, if it's a point on the Earth, which point on the Earth it is when we decide what the 52, what the 8 stands for, right? So if this is 52 degrees north and 8 degrees uh, east, then this is kind of the place where I live. Um, I mean, not very far from it, but it's just like if it is in meters, then it's very close to the equator if, the, if, if counting starts at the equator. Right, so we represent locations by numbers, and only when we understand the coordinate reference system, then we 
understand also we have a shared understanding about which locations we talk about, right? That is the idea of spatial reference systems. We have temporal reference systems. For instance, here you see a string. Um, this is the string of the time that I generated this slide. Um, oh, it's the last minute. Um, it's, a, it's a text, right? So it's a text. So we understand this because we have enough shared understanding of how we sort of encode times, but no, not everyone will, will, will understand this. And for instance, what does the CEST uh, mean and so on, right? So how is, this, how is this understood and how does this relate to you know, other places on the earth where they have different times on their clocks and how do they go find out whether two times are the same thing. So you need reference systems. Then there are uh, things like attribute reference systems. So I talked about uh, the measurement scales, right? So this is one elementary thing. So do I have a categorical or a numerical variable? If I have categories, what does one, two, and three mean? Maybe they have names, hopefully they have names, and then they will be in a language and you will need them in another language or something like that, right? Uh, so that is, that is one thing, so, so encoding, but uh, if we have numeric data, there are large systems for this. This is called U UCUM, Unified Code for Units of Measure. There is a large sort of standardized effort of how I express uh, physical and chemical and all possible measures that, that I can, sort of what are the, the SI measurement units and so on. There's a lot of work on that. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are semantic reference systems, so that uh, basically explain, they try to explain how concepts relate together, right? So you can think of a, a textbook explaining this, right? Robert brought a textbook yesterday that explains you what a random forest is. So we have a shared understanding what random forest. Although I'm not so sure whether the computer code of Leo Brahman is the shared understanding or whether the explanation of these uh, books are the better shared understanding. But um, there are textbooks, other things are vocabularies. Ontologies are systematic sort of hierarchical schemes of uh, words, words and how they relate. Uh, to each other, but you can also think the R function index, right? If you go to R manual pages, you get a function index and sort of these are the functions you can use and then you can write expressions and do computations and so on. And you can, you know, show that to somebody else and then the somebody might, you know, rerun it or try to understand that and so on. Um, we will limit ourselves to four reference systems here. Uh, that might be enough. So we have space, time, quality, and the discrete reference system. So space, as I mentioned, is, is the spatial reference system. could be three-dimensional. That is the most that we can, can uh, at least understand, uh, that at least I can understand. Um, usually it is two-degree, two-dimensional, and so we could think of it as, as two-dimensional pairs of observations, WG, WGS84, which is a system that, that, that sort of binds uh, latitude and longitude pairs to the to the world, and uh, we could say R2 or R3 as uh, two or three dimensional systems. Time is usually one dimensional; it might be cyclic, so it will be real numbers. Um, but sometimes it's two dimensional. So if you if we do predictions in the future, then we have sort of the moment of prediction and a moment for which we predict, and we get it's kind of an interesting two dimensional. Uh, 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 time systems and so on. It's continuous. Uh, quality is then the things that we talk about, so the things we measure, so the properties of the world, I would say, is, is, is uh, in the easiest sense is one-dimensional, can be nominal, ordinal, and so on, uh, or can be anything expressed numerically with, uh, with units of measurements. Uh, might also be higher dimensional. Yeah? So we have functional data, like if we have satellite imagery, we have like uh, colors, right? We have a spectral curve. Um, a lot of, so we may have chemical composition, we may have grain size distributions, we may have um, radioactivity is typically measured in a, in, in a, in a spectrum of, of, of alpha gamma dose rates uh, with different, in, different frequencies or something like that. I don't understand it exactly. But a lot of data are functional, you know, come as a, as a sequence of numbers, an approximation of function rather than, than single numbers. Um, and most important, we have the discrete reference system. Yeah? So we had to import it here to indicate at some stage that we have distinct entities, right? So we have objects or events. Um, so um, think, yeah, for the simplest case, right, think a database, a record, right, a record in a database, but also think uh, this building is this building, right? It's a thing. Uh, think the persons in this room. We are all individuals, right? So we have, if, we want, if I want to point to a person, it's very uh, inconvenient to use space and time for that. I can do that, but if you walk away, 
you know, you walk away and I have to sort of, I have to, it, it's gone, right? So it's much more easier to use names, right? So I met, and, and that is my sort of my indicator. You, you would, in a list of persons, you would use my first name, and, and my first name will work in, in many cases because there are quite a few, only very few editors in this world. Um, so, um, yes, it's, it's fun to find yourself when you Google your first name. Um, is create uh, entities, um, so IDE. So think relational databases, right? Uh, relational databases don't, don't say anything about the order in which they store records, but you want to be able to identify records in a database, right? So that's why databases have a primary key. So every table, the primary key indicates which record is which, right? So we are able to indicate records in a database. Um, R does not have primary keys because it, it keeps the record order, right? Records in the data frame are ordered. So it's enough to remember the row number, right? Uh, unless you do a, a selection because then the row numbers change. So you could have uh, row numbers as, as indicators, right? You can have like row numbers with, with, with tags, with ideas that, that remain there after you do selection. Um, so then when we'll go to sort of world representations, given these four reference systems, uh, we argue in this, uh, in this paper on, on meaningful spatial prediction and aggregation, we argue that we can sort of uh, model the rest, yeah, so to speak. And then there are basically two large uh, things that we should distinguish. One is the thing where we have fields, yes, and in the case of fields we have continuous phenomena. Right? And continuous phenomena can be written as functions from the uh, Cartesian product from s of space and time to a quality. Yes, that means so think. Yes, the easiest thing temperature in this room. So there's air, you know, air temperature everywhere in this room. It's continuous. There is not like it's only a limited set of locations you could measure it. Um, you know, if you would try to measure them all, you have to of course bring in all the devices and so on, and the air would be gone. So there are practical problems, but sort of the conceptual thing is that we have continuous space, continuous time uh, in, in, in a particular area, uh, and, and for every combination of space and time, we have one single value, right, which is the air temperature. So this is a property of fields. And it doesn't matter whether space is one, two, or three-dimensional, or whether time is a moment, or whether time is a, a continuous thing. This is basically how fields look like. Uh, the simple answers are then, uh, what is there, what is then and there, right? What is the temperature at this location at this moment? I could go and measure that, right? The simple, because I go from left to right, so I evaluate the function. So if I know the function, I could evaluate the function and compute basically the outcome. If I only have a few measurements, I could go and interpolate, and that would be sort of an, 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 an estimate, estimation plug-in for, for, for a measurement, right? So a prediction. So that makes sense, a prediction makes sense when I have a field. I can also invert sort of when or where was that, was, was sort of when, so where, when was the temperature above 22 degrees uh, in this room, and where was that, was that sort of close to the ceiling also, or close to the windows or something like that. Um, and I can, of course, go into simpler forms of fields as we typically do with what we've seen with the raster package uh, yesterday a lot, where we say, well, we only have mappings for space, to a value or mappings from time to a value. So this is a spatial field, this is a temporal field or a time series. Right, so time series are fields, spatial fields are fields. Um, note that I didn't say anything about rasters or about discretizing or so. This is all still conceptual about the phenomenon as we believe it is, as we sort of think it is. So we can never sort of check or verify that it is like this, but we believe it, at least I believe it is. Um, and then, of course, if we do things, if we collect data, we can do that in different ways, right? We can uh, sample fields, we can compute things, we can look at coverages. I think I have a couple of examples here. So here's a classical example of the Muse data set interpolated. So heavy metal concentrations of an area um, in the floodplain where the river sort of is here and you see high levels along the river. And so, and it's a, you can see it's a raster, right? Even there's a little sort of lining thing that, uh, that, that R does very unnicely um, for some reason that I don't understand. Uh, so you can see the, the raster cell. So I represented a field, an interpolated field in this case by raster. But here on the right hand side we see the original points that I interpolated for this. And it's a field that's represented by points. 
So, um, so these are the measurements, right? I didn't measure, I didn't measure on the raster. I measured kind of, you know, regularly distributed over this. So this is a, it, it's not a continuous representation. By the way, this is also not a continuous representation. These are points on a raster, right? So in, I interpolated to points. Then I threw it into some kind of plotting routine, and that, you know, used little square cells that aligned nicely with the raster sort of discretization that gave it the color, right? But these are points. If I would show points, you would see nothing, right? Because points are, points are infinitely small, so they're smaller than pixels on the, on the projector, and, and we wouldn't see anything. Likewise here, these are, these are areas that we display. It's a usual display, but if they are really points, and it would show them as points, you wouldn't see anything, right? So they are plotted as symbols with a certain size, uh, with an area that's much, much larger than the physical area. Um, I will, so, of course, you can't observe at points. I will get back to that. Other representations I can do is contour lines. Well, this looks very ugly. This is what R does, so different software might do it much better, or maybe R has made better routines to do this. But this is a contour line representation of, uh, sorry, of this uh, map, right? Uh, and then here I said, well, uh, you know, same thing. But, but sort of classify it and, and sort of aggregate the cells that have the same class. And uh, I could have used some more fancy contouring program that would instead of give the, the, the sort of the blocked lines would sort of give some smooth lines or something like that. So this is a polygon representation. So to, to cut it short, uh, basically what I want to say is that when we have fields, they might come as rasters, they might come as points, they might come as uh, contours, they might come as they might come as lines, yes, contour lines. They might come as uh, polygons. So, so where, uh, where of course, for good reasons, Robert said yesterday or the day before yesterday that, you know, think continuous phenomena, you think rasters and uh, objects, you think point lines, polygons. Uh, this is not the case, right? So we have fields, we have continuous phenomena. We can represent them, show them, display them, store them in all kinds of different ways where one is more convenient or more useful than the other, but it's not excluding. Um, and uh, other things that we often see is, is when we have a categorical. So this is, of course, a, a continuous variable. These are heavy metal concentrations in, in the topsoil. Uh, if you have categorical phenomena, so like here, for instance, a, a map of land use that I, that I sort of in a hurry grabbed from, uh, I think this is Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, that I grabbed from the internet without revealing the source. So I'm very sorry for the authors. I don't hope they, they find they I hope they're not watching me in a live stream. Uh, but uh, in all respect, a very good map that basically shows a categorical variable land use mapped over an area, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, which is also a field, yes, but not a continuous variable, a categorical variable, it's a nominal variable. But for every point, so these are polygons, of course, but for every point, in principle, it, it suggests that this is paste here. Now, there are errors in this map, and so it's not like this will go, this is 100% pure and right and correct and so on, but this is a representation where every point is, in principle, uh, uh, mapped. So from, for every point in space, it gives you the value. That is the meaning of the map. So they're polygons with colors. Other polygons with colors are maps like these, yes? Um, which have a different meaning. Yeah? So this is the coral plate map, and this is so as, as opposed to the coverage, yes, they look the same, they're polygons with, with colors, but they represent something different. Here we see population per square mile by state. Yeah? So this is how the data comes. So this is the state of Texas, and it has some uh, population density, and the whole state is colored with that value. Right? But it doesn't mean that when you go somewhere in Texas, that the population density will be here like this at that point, right? So what is represented here is a value that is sort of relevant for the whole state, but not relevant for individual points in this state, only averaged over the state. Yes? So when you argue differently for the previous map, why would you say there are two that for forests that, that, that the average is the general when coverage height is not the same point there? Well, I, I argued that this map will not be perfect. The difference between the two is that in this 
case, that's a very, very good question. So the difference between the two, uh, they look morphologically the same, they are polygons with colors, right? They look the same. Here, the, the lines we see, so the boundaries between polygons, are the outcome of a mapping process of the variable that is shown. Yes? So this is the variable shown. We try to map it, we try to map the boundary between uh, forest and pasture. Right? And we got this, this boundary, we tried to map that. Right? Whereas here, the boundaries between polygons are not the outcome of an attempt to map population density. Yes, they are an administrative given thing, so the data come like this. So somebody you know, had population data by state. So the data came to us aggregated, and we can, of course, plot them in the map, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, we only go wrong when we do things like, uh, you know, put them in a raster or something like that, right? If you would sort of represent this in a raster and take uh, on a kilometer grid all these values, put them in a raster. This would be completely wrong, and this would be much less wrong. Also, you know, has errors, has purities and so on, has mapping errors, but this is not as completely wrong as, as this one, right? This is, so there are methods here for this kind of data. There are methods to go to the lower level data, which is called dosimetric mapping, uh, where you try to sort of, from, from aggregated values, try to sort of uh, downscale, so to speak. Things like population density are all kind of different things. Uh, but the, the, uh, the problematic thing is that uh, in our sort of GIS or in, in our R sessions or grass sessions or so, we tend to uh, represent this, this thing and this thing in the same way, basically, as, as polygon, you know, polygon data coverages or something like that, where they are their interpretation is quite different. Um, so I, this is only f I was only talking about fields, yes? And you could still think, uh, well, you could argue whether this is a field because it's population density, uh, and these are, of course, people, right? So the, the people are individuals, are objects. So I'm going to switch to the, so the second type of thing, and that is basically that we have entities. Yes, and entities, I, I use the word entities because I'm looking at space and time, and if I talk about objects, then we typically think about objects in space and not objects in time. So we don't talk so much about objects in time. We then usually use the word events, events in time. Um, so the functional form for events or objects, so for entities, is a mapping from D, made based essentially from, from the things that identify the object or event, that identify the entity, to uh, their location in space, to their moment in time, and potentially to a property value. Right? Not everything has a property value, so if we talk about persons in this room, I'd not, you know, I'd we could just say that the people, us, right? Uh, property is person or something like that, and we <laughs> forget about that. So the, the quality is not always there, right? So we could say for generality. So if we don't have properties, we say it's a one, right? One meaning, yes, person, it's person. Um, special cases are there, that of a spatial point pattern. So spatial point pattern is at this moment the locations of us in this room, right? That is. You know, we quite regularly distribute it. This would not go for a random distribution. Um, although it's quite empty here in the front. Uh, another thing is that the temporal point pattern, right? Um, so we uh, could have temporal point pattern would be sort of the events over time that, that happen. Um, so you could think of, uh, well, um, temporal point pattern sort of the uh, event, people being born, or something like that, right? If you could assign that to a moment in time, or, or, or earthquakes, or something like that, over a time series in a certain area. Of course, you have to, to constrain that spatially, right? You have to say, well, the people that get born, or the people that die in uh, Bergen, right? In the region, administrative Bergen, Bergen region, who are registered there, and so on. So uh, then we get times, right? So we, for each object, for each uh, event for each person, we get the moment of, of birth or of, or of death, which is a temporal point pattern. So uh, we see here, interestingly, as opposed to here, yes, uh, that space and time are on a different side of the arrow, right? So we have mappings here from space and time to a quality, so functional form, and here we have for discrete entity, 
from the sort of the, the identification thing something to space and time. So space and time are here of interest. Yeah, so where are we, right? So the when were people born or, or died? People did people die? So, um, so they are the let's say they are the outcome of of an uh, of an process. Uh, I mentioned non-moving. Uh, this can be generalized to things to things when things move, uh, but it changes a little bit because if we have moving things, then we basically have a mapping from time to space, right? If we have movement, then that means that for every moment in time, I am somewhere, right? It's not the reverse. So for me, discrete entity, D, me, I have a sequence of time, you know, a continuous sequence of time, if for every point in time, I am somewhere. So what we get is my trajectory, right? And we can also look at the collection of our trajectories. Uh, and and this is, so this generalizes, uh, so if, if there would not be, if, if, if time, sort of if location, would not change as a function of time, uh, we, we end up with these guys, right? We end up with, we can basically write it as the, as the Cartesian product space and time. Otherwise, space is a function of time. Um, movement doesn't have to be continuous. Movement can be sudden, right? Think of uh, uh, political boundaries, right? We, had, we used to have two Germanys. Now we have one Germany, things like that. We used to have one Ukraine, um, whatever. Um, People might be listening. Uh, a generalization of this, as I mentioned, is, uh, is that a generalization? Oh, it's, so this, this thing is a generalization of that thing, right? So here I assume there's no movement. There might be movement in this thing. Specializations would be uh, only the time, sort of the change over time of some property, or the change over space of some property. Right, so if I throw out uh, space, I could look at the time, you know, the time, the time series of my blood pressure, yes, which would be, you know, which would disregard locations. Uh, if I would get, throw out time, you might, of course, look at, uh, you know, you might sort of map all my all my blood pressures, you know, on their locations and make a map of that, but it would no longer show where I was at a certain moment or something like that. Yeah, so, so I can get to simpler forms, but they are sort of simplifications. So that is what we try. So and with, this is basically the three. So in the end, we have like two types, right? We have the field, the field, and then we have the moving entities of which non-moving entities are a special case, right? So the world is very simple, you would say. Um, regrettably, it is not the case. Um, so. Um, we have to think. Uh, so this is an, it is a bit of an ideal, idealized uh, picture that I that I display here. Uh, the thing is that we don't really sort of can we cannot really observe at at points, right? So we cannot make observations of zero duration. I argue here. So measurement takes time, right? We can measurements can be very fast, but they always take time. And also measurement observation, and so it takes. Uh, space, right? You can't, points are really, points are infinitely small, so uh, measurement devices have a physical size, right? Our eyes has a physical size and so on. So we always have a measurement support, so basically what we measure is always some kind of a, an, an, an average, you know, is an, is an aggregate over, over a time period and over a spatial volume. And so soil scientists know that, that you have to take a soil sample, and the soil sample can be small, can be large, can be a mixed sample of samples that from a certain area that we then you know, grind together and sort of throw in the auto-analyzer. Uh, remote sensing, it's even getting worse because the satellites have only you know, very far away, and so pixels represent like 30 meters or 250 meters on, on, the, earth, on, the, on the Earth's surface, right? So one observation sort of reflects some kind of property that is quite often not even linearly averaged, but that is somehow averaged over an area of, this, of the Earth surface, or maybe the cloud surface, or something like that. Um, another um, thing that happens is often that we want, that quite often we want to uh, estimate or co even compute aggregated values. We can either estimate or compute them. As I uh, mentioned in the first example, so the Sum, the summed em CO2 emissions for Germany is a computed number. It's not an estimate, it's computed, it's a sum. So if these are my data, 
that's all the data there is. So the sum is the value, so it's an aggregated value. Uh, there's no estimation involved. If I would sort of do a, try to do an, an, an average for Germany for the PM10 values, I of course don't have all the measured values, I only have a limited set, I can estimate that, right? So here's the distinction between aggregation or computing and estimation, estimation of averages. That is di two different procedures. Uh, where the difference is often between uh, uh, fields and between objects. And, and um, so estimation involves statistics, involves uncertainties, involves statistical model and so on. Uh, and, and so many people think that, uh, that you know, statistical modeling is a bad thing, but there is no way around it. Yes, quite often for fields, measurement is always absolutely partial, right? You can never measure fields completely. So either it's partial or it's you get ever, uh, aggregated values, and uh, you have to deal with that. Right? So quite often there's no way around to doing that. Um, even more often, the data we get were aggregated, right? They were aggregated, they come as aggregated data, like here. We, this is what we have. We don't have the persons, right? If we knew the locations of the persons where they live, we could compute any, you know, any visualization from that in terms of densities with any resolution and color you, want, you would want, but this is aggregated before we got it, and that is quite often the case that we have that. Either for convenience, because the original data are large, like 200 million addresses, and then you have to have to go through them, uh, or for privacy concerns, like for health data, they come typically strongly aggregated because this is a privacy related. Um, an example that we looked at in this paper is the Air Quality in Europe report. So, so the Air European Environmental Agency does a lot of very interesting things, uh, and it is of course very you know nice to look at what they do and, and how this relates to what we think. Uh, and, and I was once in a conversation with the former director of, uh, of the agency, and she actually told me that the agency doesn't use models. They don't want to use models. They said, we do only computations. We do computations. We do no statistical models, right? Uh, you know, they had a fair point. We were in a meeting once with a couple of people looking at air quality data, and they were sort of confronting us with these uh, types of graphs, and the question on the table was there, what does the graph mean? Uh, and we see here PM10 annual mean values for traffic stations, for urban stations, for rural stations, and then computed per year. Uh, there seems to be some funny shift in the years, but anyway. So per year, and then this is connected with a line, right? It's not like interpolation takes place. No, it's just a line. This is the, the timeline, right? How we typically display uh, time series data. This is... This is annual mean value, so they should have used sort of constant and then, and then the next constant. But anyway, this is how they, how they did it, which is fine. Um, question is what it means. So the report suggests air quality in Europe. Uh, the um, contents uh, give station characteristics. So we get, average, we get average values for a set of stations. Yes? And the question on the table then is, of course, we can, you know, it's easy to compute an average in a time series or an average for a set of stations. Uh, let's select stations, you know, that, that, that were already there in 2005 so that expansion of Europe doesn't play too much of a role in disturbing all kinds of uh, images. But um, it's, it's, it's the set of stations you're talking about. It's not Europe, right? There's a difference. So this is the average of a set of stations and only that. So if you would estimate the value for Europe, um, it might not be a you know, might not be completely different from this one, but first of all, it would be a value with uncertainty because you didn't measure it, and and second of all, it might be pretty complicated to estimate it because these measurements are kind of unevenly distributed. So we typically have a lot of measurements in Western Germany, uh, sort of Western Europe, uh, and and much less also because of the history, uh, and much less in, in in Eastern Europe because of the recent expansions of the. Europe as it's, as it's understood by the EEA, which is a completely different thing. Uh, are there questions to that point? So, so you can compute averages for points, and they're just that, averages for points. So they reflect the averages of these points. And without knowing the set of points that you talk about, it's very difficult to interpret what, what, what it is, what this really is about. Um, 
So uh, then there are slight more complications. Um, as, as, we, you know, as we look at these data, uh, you might think, well, we are, I argued before that PM10 is a field variable that is everywhere, right? So we have field variables that you could interpolate. We did that, but we did it for, typically we do that for rural uh, stations. The thing is, if you take urban stations and you're going to interpolate these, how, you, how do you go with, you know, with the urbanness, right? So where would you interpolate? So most of the interpolations, if you look at the map of Europe, then 95% of the area is non-urban, right? So how do you do? How do you interpolate that? And it gets much worse if you uh, if you look at uh, traffic stations, because traffic stations are those stations. This is European regulation. This every city that measures has to measure air quality uh, has to measure it at least at one location where the city suspects it's the worst, right? So these are the street canyons. So it is like in principle, if you think about PM10, it's everywhere, it's a continuous field, but the field has maxima, right? And the maxima are the street canyons, we, we think, right? We, it's probably true. Right? And there we measure, right? So we get a field that has, you know, that is value, and then zip goes up, and then goes down, and here we measure it, and then, and then zip, it goes up, and goes, and here we measure it, right? And it goes up, here we don't measure it, goes down. And so how we go about interpolating these things? So this was one of the, my first, when I first looked into air quality data, I ignored the station type, and it shouts you in the face, right? This is, this is hopeless, this is a nightmare. So by measuring the extremes, right? And the extremes happen at very short distance. If you compare a, a, a traffic station with a, an urban background station, you get the largest differences. At the largest differences in PM10 at the smallest sort of spatial distances, because only in cities we have nearby measurements. Uh, so it is from a statistic. So it is completely hopeless to interpolate. So you could even argue that the rural stations here, the, sorry, the traffic stations here are objects, you know, are, are events. They are maxima of a field, right? Just as as we identify uh, hurricanes as as some threshold over a wind field, right? A hurricane is a thing. We you know it moves around, but it's 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 a sort of it's an event defined from a continuous field, from a wind field, as, as being the maximum. Uh, so here we are kind of in a hybrid, as I said, it's kind of an intermediate phenomena. Uh, so it, it, it is a continuous variable, but uh, it is still, it's the maxima of that. So they're, they're kind of the, the mountain peaks, so to speak, right? So we, we should not, you know, we can't interpolate these things. Um, we can count them and describe them and so on, but it's not like... Uh, it's simple to interpret as a field, or not, not you know, think of interpolation functions. Uh, then, well, if you have a good idea, I would be open to <laughs> to, to to hear it. So, the, well, it's it. So, interpolation basically uh, the 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 ground the basic idea of interpolation is that when when we have measurement value somewhere that the direct surrounding is relatively similar to that measured value compared to, you know, to a distant value. So when we look at, uh, if we look at air quality, then it goes like this in, air, in, in sort of street canyons. So in a street canyon, it will be very high. One street further, which is 50 meters, it has dropped like with a factor three. And then one street further again with a factor three. So it is, you have an, a phenomenon that is relatively, you know, behaves relatively smooth when you look at the larger areas, but it has extreme gradients when you look at the places of the traffic stations. So uh, it is, in that sense, sort of making one model, sort of one interpolation model that both captures rural areas, urban background, and traffic stations. I haven't seen anyone doing that. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's very challenging. They, they're conceived as basically as different processes. It's, and I don't think that interpolation makes sense because we have one street canyon in, in this city and then one street canyon in that city. And what's going on there, right? Between. Well, so that's why you do it, the regression type model and then interpolate the city, perhaps. I, I don't think this will work for this kind of day, but in general you do that. Yes, yes. You can, you know, but, but people would try to, to model the air dynamics in the street canyon. Right on on a sort of on a on a maybe on a ten centimeter scale, 
to you know to capture the dynamics there. You wouldn't do that on on, on you know on the rest of Europe. <laughs> so uh, people try to try to model these things, but but use use basically use physically based models. That that seems to make more sense. Um, okay, then we have uh, so we have difficult phenomena that are difficult to say. Well, uh, you know, it's it's a field, but it's not really like you know, it's like uh, mountain peaks are not really elevation observations, right? So it's not you're not going to interpolate them. Uh, then we have the hybrid things in the sense that things can become sort of a mix of of discrete uh, of of event type things in space and field and time or vice versa. So. We could have like um, uh, the hybrid where we have uh, spatial events and time fields, uh, which which basically is the, uh, the the coal power plant emissions. So if you look at the emission of a single coal power plant, it's a time series, right? So we have continuous emissions that we could measure every moment of our aggregate over the day or aggregate over the year and so on. But it's a it's a time field. Uh, but we said in space, no, they are in space. They are. Uh, they're coal power plants. It's not like between two coal power plants, we have another one. Um, and the other thing is that you could have uh, spatial fields and, and temporal events. Yeah, so uh, um, examples are elections. We had a 2012 European uh, Parliament elections uh, so that have, um, that have a particular time, but, but spatially they're they are distributed, right? So of course they are, you know, again you have to then look at aggregated values, not that the, not that the individual votes, the individual votes would again be events. Uh, but so you can, so it's so the field object dichotomy kind can, you know, can go different ways when you either concentrate or time or concentrate on on space. Um, so then, um, yeah, so this is a bit of work, um, and and the so the. Uh, the consequences of this paper, of this meaningful paper, uh, actually said that, well, uh, so it, it matters whether we have one type of the variable or another type of the variable. So how do we implement these things in, uh, in software? And I had to admit that sort of when we did these things 10 years ago, we really uh, went into the sort of the, the pragmatics of how do the data come, right? In the pragmatics of the how do data come is basically, well, you know, data are, is there morphology? You know, are these points, lines, polygons, or grids? And then, uh, you know, whenever, whatever they are, we import them and we start doing things with them without really thinking what they represent, right? And that is, of course, a, uh, um, it is some kind of a warning in the sense that uh, I actually learned from my students these examples, like, you know, we interpolated emission maps. Like, you know, I, I looked at it and I said, what's wrong? I couldn't tell immediately. It took a while, um, years maybe, uh, <laughs> to... Uh, but it's good. I mean, I'm very grateful to the students who made these mistakes. And they made, I mean, they were in my class, right? So they, despite that they were in my class, I couldn't understand why they would. Um, so anyway, so I'm not talking about interpolation anymore, but, or how to interpolate, but about when to interpolate. <laughs> so to speak. Um, then, uh, how do we re represent these things? Yeah, so let's first look at fields. So to, how do we represent fields? Well, why don't we represent them as functions? Yes, they are functions. So why don't we represent them as functions and evaluate it when we need them, right? So I, I went through these examples and said, well, you know, there's these, all these kind, different kind of things. Well, this is the measurement process. Then we interpolate it, but why do we eat like this? These are points. Why is this grid? You know, why don't I do this on the grid size 10 times as fine, why don't I do it in an irregular grid? Why don't I do it in a grid which is fine where I need it and which is coarse where I don't need it or something like that, right? So they are all conventions, they are decisions and so on that are relatively arbitrary, nobody worries really. But in the end it's a function uh, and I could, you know, you could argue, why don't you do that? So the interpolation function returns values at arbitrary times and moments or arbitrary locations. Um, so it should be uh, time, it should be arbitrary times and, and locations, of course. Here, uh, so we have in, we have IDW, we have in first distance interpolation or creaking interpolation or something like that. That does that in space. That takes observations and takes a prediction location and then interpolates. And and in time series we have the NA dot approx, which is an approximate, this linear approximation uh, between two measured time points and, and interpolates uh, in time if you want for time series. Um, 
uh, of course, typically we don't do that. Uh, although there have been uh, there have been proposals, uh, uh, like ten years ago, of somebody who is uh, uh, somebody from Delft University who has also thought about this in in terms of how do we communicate information and said, well, uh, basically what we you know what you the the all, all the decisions about interpolation are are so arbitrary. Why don't you just communicate the data and the interpolation function and 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 let it evaluate whenever whenever it needs to be evaluated. So evalu evaluation is is relatively um, uh, cheap, right? That never that never really happened. But of course we do communicate functions and, and what and procedures quite a lot. So so that's fine. So whenever I do an interpolation, you could do it with a finer grid, and so that's no problem at all. Um, but typically we do it, and when we evaluate the function, so we compute the interpolation, and then we uh, give that in, in, in typically in discretized space, and typically for fields we take a regular discretization, so there's no other reason than, than convenience, right? Uh, irregular discretizations would be finite elements, yes, which modelers use, so if you have, to, if, if we need to uh, you know, solve differential equations with the number of points, then it makes sense to have more points in areas where we have higher gradients. Yeah, so we use finite elements. There's nothing wrong with that. Finite elements are kind of a triangular interpolation network, which we could also use to, to do these things. Go to a, to a set of points and, and represent them by these points and the assumptions that in triangles it, it would be, again, a, a, a flat surface or something like that. And so these are all possibilities that we ne never do. We always go to a, to a regular uh, raster, either a raster or... Uh, but it could be in, uh, irregular points, spatial points. Uh, and in uh, time, we do the same thing. We represent them by regular time series. So TS, uh, the TS objects that come from stats, or irregular time series can be re represented by uh, zoo objects in package zoo or XTX objects in package XTX, about which I will talk a little bit about later. Um, natural would also be, uh, yeah, so I'm thinking now about timing. So we have a break at 10.30, right? Um, so I'm thinking about sort of, you know, continue talking for 15 minutes or so, and then I will not talk much for the rest of the day, right? So that's it. So uh, so I will, don't, don't think that I'm going to talk all day. I, I don't know. Well, there's a few slides to come. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's all kind of technology to do these things in space or in time, and we will also address how to do these things in space and time. Um, natural would be to use an index that relates to space and or time, and records and records with arbitrary field, arbitrary types field. So, uh, yeah, so uh, storing fields um, uh, as, you know, as we as we say fields are mappings from space and time to to a value uh, we would you know we, we basically discretize space we discretize time we can't sort of otherwise we would have the continuous function and and store the function evaluated on the fly when needed uh, but if we store things then we basically need an index over space an index over time and then have the the, the mapped values the field values uh, back for that um, so I'm now thinking about sort of how to uh, how to store these things, and 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 how to do this this better, how to do this in the future. Uh, so arrays is a natural uh, thing that that also came up yesterday a lot. Uh, so arrays are um, like uh, arrays are sort of regularly discretized things in multiple dimensions, right? So you can think of a matrix as a two-dimensional array, and, and a matrix with numbers can represent, of course, a a uh, a satellite image, right, with one with one color, but then you have multiple bands, so you have like 15 different bands, so you have like 15 matrices, so that makes a three-dimensional array, right, where we only have stored latitude, longitude, and then and then band, right, and we have may have data for that for multiple times, for every two weeks for MODIS data, so we have like another 150 time replicates of that. That gives you a fourth dimension, so you end up easily with sort of with remote sensing imagery we the natural data come like as, as four dimensional data uh, where, where only two of the dimensions are, are space and and as Robert mentioned yesterday um, uh, air or, or geologist or geophysicist or air quality uh, sort of air uh, uh, meteorologists uh, model the atmosphere in layers 
So they have two-dimensional space, but then in layers, so they have like 10 or 20 layers, usually at different sort of uh, different heights. Um, so that easily gives gives uh, a demand for for five dimensions. If you have different attributes, you know, you have temperature, you have pressure, you have uh, uh, water uh, water content. Uh, you, I mean, humidity and so on. So that gives rise to five-dimensional arrays, right? So, um, so you can store these things as arrays. Um, arrays, there is an array type in 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 R. So array, so R has no, in principle, no problem with uh, with uh, arrays. So I can make a uh, three-dimensional array by saying, well, order the uh, numbers one to eighty-one in a three by three by three array. And I get this array, right? So you see it's a three by three by three array, so it's a cube, you know, and I can go on with four dimensional and so on. And I can index, sort of take, give me the first, uh, give me the first layer, um, uh, or give me the, the you know, the, 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 the slice, the second slice, the first slice in the second dimension, or give me the, the first slice in the third dimension, and so on. I can index these arrays, right, whatever the dimension is in a very easy way. Uh, one thing is that the array needs to be of one single type, right? So my records uh, need to be all of the same type. They're numeric here, yes? So mode of A is numeric. So I have numeric data. I can also uh, say, well, if B um, equals A is smaller than 45, I have B, which is a, which is a Boolean, right? mode of B, so I can, logical, so I can also uh, do different types, of do type character, or do type this, or type that, but it has to be single type. So arrays in R are always of a single type, so I cannot have like uh, a five-dimensional array where my sort of point in these five dimension is a record with elements of different types. So there is a, a limitation there, so I can't have like a record in one array that's a combination of uh, of a logical and a numerical, and and some categorical thing, right? That isn't something that R does not allow you to do, uh, and also raster does not does not. Well, it mimics the factors, but it does not really allow you to do that. Um, I don't think that NetCDF can do this because I think it's pretty much oriented to numerical data. I think that HDF5 can do it, these kind of things. So NetCDF and HDF5 are uh, data formats that many, that basically all climate scientists use to store you know, climate model or weather model data and so on. Um, so, so a lot of high dimension array data come in these formats and it's useful to be able to read them, R can read them, but then of course cannot store them if it can't represent these things sensibly, right? So you have to create your own classes. Uh, so, as I said, arrays and uh, also rasters, rasters in package raster do not support field of a, of a truly mixed type. Uh, for time series, zoo and XTS, which are kind of the, the, the sort of the two main uh, packages for time series data, do not do also not support fields of mixed type. So they are basically matrices, yes, two-dimensional arrays where the rows of the matrix have a time index or have an index, an ordered index for zoo, or have a time index for index XTS. So matrices have to be of a single type, so you can't have mixed type uh, things. Um, spatial grid data frames do, they're not used very much because they're sort of things that happen in memory, but they're in SP. So um, how do we sort of, how does, um, uh, and, and for space and, and time, also package space time does. Yes. And, and a raster database, we would say processing engine, it's more than a database alone that also does that is, uh, is CIDB. I don't know exactly whether this is sort of, of, of very high value, but it's, it's something that, that should, should not go unnoticed. Um, yeah, so, so mixed type, um, so basically what, uh, what, what, how we sort of mix type in, in, uh, in, in R is basically represented in data frames, right? So in data frames you have your variables that are of any type, they can be logical and then numerical and then there's a, a factor and then there's a character or something like that. Uh, and and they're, you know, they're essentially stored as columns. I will, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, 
And then there's another question uh, which might be easier, that is the one how to store object events, because um, the, I, I think the, the natural sort of the, 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 if you would say, the default way of, of, of R is, is, is that, that maps from databases where I have a collection of records, right, a, a data frame, and, and each record basically represents a single uh, object. For instance, a measurement or a person or, a, or an event or something like that. So, so this is not, an, uh, not a difficult thing to do. Um, tables, all tables are one-dimensional arrays, right? So, so uh, if we say, well, we have different things, my, disc, my discrete reference system, different things, well, why not store them as, as records, right? So in a one-dimensional array, list, list them. Uh, all the spatial stars, so spatial X data frames, points, lines, uh, uh, grids, polygons, uh, data frame objects in SP behave like tables or behave like a data frame. We will get into that a little bit later. And, and you can do all kind of subsetting, so subset a specific uh, element of, of a collection, right? And that works, uh, except for spatial grid data frame might go into that. Um, okay, so, um, so, so, far for the, so far for the theory. Um, having, having said that, um, having said that, uh, of course we, still have the have the problem as as well we have so, sort of a conceptual problem as I see it that we have basically two very different things either fields or uh, entities and that we have all kind of ways to represent data in R that basically follows the morphology and not the meaning in the sense of, of are these fields or are these entities and and so the so the type of questions we we ask on our data is not very much can by that by that as a consequence not be very much guided by how we represent our data in R, and, and there's a lot of room for improvement, I think. Uh, but that is, that is basically future research. Um, so, uh, so are there any questions to my theoretical expose? Yes, okay. Chevier. Chevier. Um, probably, yeah. So can you do an, an S, S dot array? So if you have a stack, a raster stack would be a three-dimensional array. And if you do S dot array, you get this array as an R array. So everything in memory, and you can index them like that. The thing what you lose is, of course, what the index means. So arrays are, you know, are not aware what the indexes represent. So they basically back to how mathematicians do their work. They say, well, everything can be expressed as matrices, and, and I'll do my bookkeeping of what is what, and, and you know, nobody cares, nobody should worry. <laughs> uh, so you, going from a raster to an array, you keep the values in their array structure, you get them, but, but lose the information how an index in X and Y relates to locations on the Earth. And, and also what, what the Z, what the third di uh, dimension means that might represent time. So raster stacks can represent temporal uh, sequences of images, uh, and, and you lose that as, as well. A list, a list of raster stacks wouldn't do the wouldn't do that job, in which the, the, the index of the element will represent time. Well, as I said, a raster stack is a sequence of rasters, and you, with raster stacks you can do the set z or so. I think you can set the function z z and, and assign time values. To the to the to the elements of the stack. So the the raster stack can understand uh, the different layers as a temporal sequence of layers. Yeah, so there's no no there is no need to do a list of raster stacks. So if you of course if you have like a remote sensing image where you have the raster stack already for different colors, then you need to do extra work because then you have a four dimensional array. So then every, every raster stack is a sort of multicolor image, so it has already, you, you, the third dimension is used for color, uh, and if you have them temporally, yeah, you need a new structure, and you can, you can use a list, uh, but, but of course the list is, is again, uh, it, it's a start, because you have everything in one object, but the list then doesn't know which stack is which time or so, right? You need to do the administration there. Which, which is stack is which time? Okay which list element represents which time. But at least you have them in one, in one data structure. 
uh, and you can organize, you can loop over them and so on. Um, space? Sorry? If you, if you try to, to instead use a, of using a list, uh, if, you, if instead of using a list of, of raster stacks, you try to pass this list of raster stacks to a data frame in which you have everything no. indexed. No, it doesn't. The, well, the, well, data frames, uh, data frames are column stores. So data frames assume that every list element is a vector of the same length, can be of different type. So if an, if, if an list element is raster stack, uh, this list cannot be or become a data frame. Uh, probably syntactically you could do it, but whenever you start doing something with that data frame, uh, the rest will crash. Uh, the rest of R assumes that data frames have list elements that are columns of equal length, one-dimensional vectors. Vectors and and raster stacks are not vectors. Is that correct? That's not correct. I would add, I think the package another object called the raster quad, which takes a fourth dimension, but it's only implemented, it's not even visible. I think to use because it becomes quite complex to do that. So, so I so will discuss later. So space time has a little bit infrastructure for this, but of course assumes again that everything is a memory. So if, if you have, you know, terabyte data, then this will become problematic. Yes. Uh, I just need an example of the difference between field and entities. Field and uh, entities. Fields and entities. Well. Uh, for entities, I said that is a, a, a collection term for uh, uh, objects and events, right? Because entities are discrete things. If we th talk about discrete things in space, we tend to talk about objects. If we talk about discrete things in time, we tend to we, we, we usually use events. So entities is a bit of a mathematical term for that. So, uh, it, it, entities refer to identifiable things, yes? For which you and I, sort of our shared in our shared understanding, it makes sense to, to identify. So if we ask, what is that? Yes, and I point to, to Nanki's laptop, then we understand that's that thing that I'm, I mean there. It's, it's Nanki's laptop. So uh, it's not a field, it's an object. So we, we, we give it a name and so on, and then we understand. And we could discuss whether the power supply is part of it or so, and what, you know, where does it begin, where does it end, and all these kind of things. But it's quite clear what we talk about, a, a thing that we identify as a thing. That's an entity. And I can't say what is that when I mean the, temper the air temperature of, like, you know, here or so. Right? You don't understand whether I mean this or, or that. Or, so it's, it's much more unclear. Right? It's, it's a continuous phenomenon that that sort of varies throughout space and it has everywhere a value and it's much harder to, to sort of identify elements of that. Yeah, so the field is a continuous function and, and by that has an infinite amount of values because that its, domain is con its domain, space and time, are continuous. So, so we, can't, we can't constrain it. And we can, of course, talk about um, d the measurements on this field. And, and these measurements you know, can be conceived as both ways because measurements are, of course, discrete activities. So I took a measurement. So what is that measurement, right? But it's a measurement on that field that is continuous. So if I talk about this field, about this phenomenon, the temperature of this room, then that is the field. And that, that is a... And a collection of, you know, you would, you would need a collection of an infinite amount of numbers to represent it, as opposed to uh, entities that are numerable. You know, there are a discrete number of laptops in this room, quite a few, but... Any other questions? We should list now. Then it is uh, five before uh, half, then I... I uh, suggest so to quit now, and I will talk a little bit more sort of about low level. Uh, are things uh, low level, sort of how data frames work and how, how 
um, talk a little bit about time series spatial data and spatial temporal data, and then uh, and explain about what vignettes are. And the rest of the day, we will basically look at, at vignettes. Or um, ah yeah, somebody suggested to also look at Tom's uh, contest, they, Tom's contest data. So maybe we can do something with that and see, mess around with that. I don't think there are many objects or events in it. It will be a field again. Ah, you have it already. So Barry will take over so after the. <laughs> very good, very good. Ttplot. We should invite the ttplot. Sorry. Can we all collude? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So let's have a break then now.